So we're in a series on the gifts of the Spirit, and um, you've heard me say this, but I want to continue to do it because it's helping so many people. Um, we are, we, all of these gifts can be put into four categories. So motivational gifts, manifestational gifts, ministerial gifts, and ministry gifts. And um, all of them are, are motivated by something, and they're, they're all found from Romans 12 all the way to Ephesians 4. And uh, we know that the motivation for these gifts, the, fu the fundamental motivation is love. Everybody say love. You're going to hear in a moment, this is actually biblical, to pursue love but desire gifts. Everybody say pursue love, pursue love. desire gifts. Among the nine gifts of the Spirit, there's discerning gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. There's dynamic gifts, faith, miracles, healings. And then here we land in the declarative gifts, which is prophecy, which is different kind of tongues or, or a variety of tongues, and that's interpretation of tongues. So this morning, we're going to enter into the final installment of the breakdown, which is declarative gifts or gifts that say something. Now, we're going to start with prophecy, but I'm not talking about end time prophecy. If you want end time prophecy, go back to our YouTube channel and listen to, we covered the entire book of Revelation. So if you want end time prophecy, you can go there for that. We're not talking about Old Testament uh, major or minor prophets. We aren't talking about that. We are talking about the gift of prophecy, one of the nine gifts of the spirit. Now they can include end time prophecy that can include major and minor prophets, but we are primarily focused on the gift that Jesus paid for according to his blood and his good works. All right. First Corinthians chapter number 14 verses one through five. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. All right. Turn to your neighbor and say, come on, get ready, get ready, get ready. Push your other neighbor, push him as hard as you can. I mean, literally, like, like throw their shoulder out of socket and say, get ready. Come on. All right. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 5. If you're watching online, uh, somebody use an emoji that you've never used before and say, I'm ready. Make it appropriate, please. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 5. The Bible says this. Sound familiar? Pursue love, but desire spiritual gifts. Here it is, but especially that you may complain. Is that what that says? But especially that you may prophesy, pursue love, desire gifts, all nine of them, but especially focus in on, zero in on prophecy. Why? Because prophecy doesn't just encourage you, it encourages those around you. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. So there is a language, Paul is saying, that goes directly to the Father that no one understands but God understands, so you have a direct line when you pray in the spirit to heaven that the enemy cannot listen in on or tap your prayer life. So he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, but no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But, verse 3, but he who prophesies speaks, here is the role of prophecy in the modern day and throughout the Bible. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. That is the three-pronged role of the gift of prophecy in the last days and in your life. Edification. If it doesn't edify, it's probably not prophecy. If it doesn't exhort, it's probably not prophecy. If it doesn't comfort, it's probably not prophecy unless we're hearing from a prophet that is prophesying to a nation, okay? We're talking rare. Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Verse 5, Paul, what do you think about speaking in tongues? Paul said, I'm glad that you ask. Here's what he says. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but I really wish more than that that you all prophesied. 
He says, because he that prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that, that, that the church may receive the edification. So Paul says, I want everyone speaking in tongues. Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you do. But Paul also says that speaking, I want you speaking in tongues, but I would much rather that you prophesy. Why? Because again, tongues edifies our body. Prophecy edifies the body of Christ. I'm going to say that again. Tongues are for are for you to build up your most holy faith. Tongues can also be used in a corporate setting so long as there is someone to interpret that tongue. So tongues edify the body, but prophecy edifies the body of Christ. Let me say it like this. Tongues build up your most holy faith. Prophecy builds up the body of Christ. So Paul says desire spiritual gifts. Everybody say desire. Desire means to burn with a zeal of the pursuit of God. He's saying, pursue God with all you have and know that in your pursuit of God, that God gives gifts along the way that you and I have access to. Is that awesome? Prophecy can be defined this way. It's the Greek word translated prophesying, and it means to speak forth or to declare the divine will of God, to interpret the purposes of God, or to make known in any way the truth of God that influences people. I got to warn you, though, prophecy is not simply preaching. How many of you love the preaching that goes forth from Gulf Coast Church week in and week out, whether it's myself, Pastor David, uh, Margo, uh, whoever's teaching our Wednesday nights, uh, uh, no matter who it is, prophecy is not simply preaching. Notice the difference. The word preach and prophecy in the Bible are totally different. Preach means to proclaim. It means to announce. It means to cry out. And it means to tell. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He did not say to prophesy the gospel. Why? Prophecy calls things that are not as though they were. But the gospel already is. And so when we declare that Jesus is alive, we're not hoping that he will manifest himself one day. He is alive and well at the right hand of the Father right this very moment. So preaching the gospel declares what's already finished in our current situation. Prophesying into your life tells you you don't see it right now, but something is coming your way in Jesus' name. Are you in the room today? So preaching and prophecy may, may include rebuking. It may include correcting. But, but prophesying always includes building and lifting up. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me give you the three main ministries of prophecy. It's going to be on the screen uh, behind me. There's three major pillars to prophecy, and they are this, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. These three can be defined to, to, to edify means to build up. It means to strengthen. To exhort or exhortation means encouragement or a calling nearer or a drawing nearer to God. And then comfort means consolation. It means the healing of distress or sorrow or persecution or suffering. And so we literally uh, can pray comfort over our nation today because God said in his word that this is the definition of prophecy. When we prophesy over the nation, we are prophesying uh, consolation. We're prophesying healing of distress healing of sorrow, healing of persecution, and healing of suffering. Do you think that we could pray that over this nation in this season? Yes, we absolutely can. So, so this gift falls under an inspiration of utterance, a gift, a gift that declares something. Now, anytime you're dealing with, I, I got to start here, and I've done this a, a couple of weeks ago, but anytime you're dealing with gifts that declare something, I, I have to urge you here and, and those watching online that we are to guard our hearts at all times 
Because anyone that is going to be used greatly by the gifts of the Spirit will also be tempted greatly by the adversary. And the temptation is not just to get you to follow a dangling carrot out in front of you until you fall into a deep pit. No, the temptation is to start believe something, something peace by peace until it gets into your heart and eventually comes out of your mouth. Anytime you're dealing with the gifts that declare something, I must urge you to guard your heart at all times. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart flows the issues of life. And so the enemy will always plant weeds in the seedbed of your heart to try to choke out the fruit of your lips. I want to say that again. The enemy is always trying to plant seeds that, that create weeds in the seedbed of your heart to begin to choke out the fruit of your lips. Because if he can't prevent it from happening, he can always prevent you from declaring it to, uh, to be about to happen or, or to unfold. So childlike faith is really the remedy to choke out what the enemy is doing and release what God is doing in your life. Childlike faith before God is always the remedy to keep your heart pure. What am I telling you? I'm telling you in the, that, in, that in this this, this rapid information age and this microwave generation, we know too much, we have access to too much, and if we're not careful, we, we are so far from childlike faith that we think we have it all figured out and God has to move within the confines of our revelation. But I'm telling you, if you would take it all the way back to the beginning, childlike faith is the answer to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. What am I saying? Childlike faith is the heart posture that God will always use to prophesy through. You, you've come by too late to tell me that he can't do it all. You've come by too late to tell me that God can't move every mountain that's in front of us. You've come by too late to tell me that he is still not a healer of the brokenhearted. You've stopped by too late if you told me that he can't still move in my children's lives, in my family's life, in this church. you come by too late. What am I telling you? I still have enough childlike faith in me that no matter what it looks like, I just believe God can do it, and there is no questions asked. When my daughter Ainsley was little, we, we visited my grandmother in Ohio, and um, in my hometown, Hamilton, Ohio, just about 30 minutes north of, of Cincinnati, there are trains that run through that town every 10 minutes, literally. So if you're late and you're 10 minutes behind, then you're going to be 20 minutes behind because there is for sure a train going to stop you on the tracks. There's one underpass. Everyone else is just getting stopped. And so when my daughter Ainsley was, was little, we had, we had moved away, and we came back to visit my grandmother. And uh, my wife and I grew up in Ohio, and so we were used to the sounds of trains, and we had almost really become numb to it. It had become dull to us. And, and Ainsley, as we're carrying her into my grandmother's home, she kept saying, Mom, Dad, she, choo, choo. And we're like, what are you talking about? There's no train. We don't hear a train. My grandmother didn't hear the train. Ainsley is adamant, Daddy, Mom, choo-choo. Everybody do that one time, choo-choo. See, I'm trying to get you to say childlike faith, and you're trying to act too sophisticated. And, and so Ainsley's like, choo-choo. And she was, she was hearing this faint sound of this train, but Carissa and I had tuned it out. Why? Because we had heard it our entire lives. Being a child, she was tuned into a frequency that we had learned to ignore and dismiss. Now, before you understand where I'm going, I have to kind of nail you for a moment to say, this is what happens to most of us in the spirit. We are so used to listening to ourselves that we become numb to someone who is all powerful, who's been speaking the entire time. Making sure y'all are here, all right? We have become our own gods. If it sounds right, if it looks right, then it must be right. If it feels right, then I got to do it. After all, I'm just following my heart. 
your Bible says that your heart is deceptively wicked. You cannot know it. It will lead you down a path and you'll end up standing up in your own destruction. And before you know it, you'll say, how did I get here? I followed my heart. And God will say, that's exactly how you got in there. And are you ready to follow my voice? There's a frequency of faith that God is calling us to. So if God says go, I don't question or, or, or try, to, try to mathematically make it happen. I just say, okay, God, if you say go, then I'm going. If God says stay, I stay. If God says talk, I talk. If God says pray, I pray. What am I saying? Childlike faith doesn't question the steps it takes to get there. Childlike faith just moves and goes without concern of what's about to happen. How many people would say, no matter what, pastor, I'm going to follow Jesus and not my heart in these last days? God is always talking. Three people. That was great. God is always talking. God is always prophetic. And God is always moving in and around our lives. Childlike faith allows us to filter out our ideas and what is right and join heaven for the real purpose that he has for us. So, I'm talking about the gifts. I'm talking about childlike faith. I'm going to make the connection, but I'm telling you, childlike faith is the recipe. If you want to be used greatly in the gifts, return to the faith of a child and see God move you. Matthew 18, 1 through 4. At that time, the frequency of faith is what I'm talking about. At that time, Jesus came, uh, the disciples came to Jesus saying, hey, Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who's the best? Who's the top dog? Who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? Who is the one that, that, that we are measuring our life by? Who, who is the greatest? Is it the one who gives the most? Is it the one who, who has been saved the longest? Is it the one who goes Wednesday nights and gives the most for the meals because we're giving them for free and we can't possibly do it without your support? That was a plug. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus called and he says, bring this little child to me. Set this child in the midst of them. And he said, surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child. They had to be thinking, but, but, but Jesus, no, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm an adult now. That would be going backwards. And Jesus is saying, no, that's actually going forward because everything that you've learned, you have to unlearn to be used by me in the kingdom. Surely I say to you, unless you are converted, saved, and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this little child will be the greatest in the kingdom. So greatness in the spirit is childlike faith with humility. We are called to prophesy. But in order for us to prophesy, our life must be lived with childlike faith. You want to know something about my children and other children? If you, if you go up and talk to kids, there's not a whole lot of gossiping going on in children's circles. Y'all are quiet in this room today. There's not a whole lot of backbiting going on in children's circles. They just want to know what's in front of them. Am I going to have fun? Am I safe? Can I love those that love me? They're, they're, just, they're very simple in how they're approaching. Keep me out of danger. I want to have fun. My son knows no bounds. We were on a boat the other day, and we're out in what I know to be shark-infested waters. My son's like, Dad. Can I jump off the boat? And I'm like, no, there's sharks in there. He doesn't know there's sharks in there. And if there is a shark, he'll try to get on the back of it and ride it as far as it can go. He doesn't know fear. Fear is a learned trait. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So when God speaks to you to prophesy, fear should not be included in that position. Declare what God, well, what would they think about me? It's not you prophesying anyway. It's God prophesying through you to them, and you need to go home and not think, well, God used me greatly. No, you're a conduit that can do it because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen to that. So we're called to prophesy. Somebody say prophesy. prophesy. What would we do with an entire church that prophesied? 
What, what if people, what, what if our first impressions ministry, that every time they opened the door, they just said, oh, wow, welcome to Gulf Coast Church. I believe that God has an incredible plan for your life, and here's the plan, boom, boom, boom. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if before you even heard the gospel that during worship, our worship team begins prophesying over you that you're entering in to a new realm and dimension? Wouldn't it be amazing that somebody on your road come up and said, listen, the, the Lord spoke to me that there's something going on in your body. There's a malady. There's a malfunction. And here's a miracle and lays hands on you and you're healed in Jesus' name. What, what, what am I trying to tell you? What would happen if the body of Christ Stop being operated by fear and operate by faith and the faith of a child and move mighty mountains on behalf of God. So there's three important things in our lives to constantly flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Here they are. A heart that is pure, humility as a lifestyle, and childlike faith. I'm going to say it again. Three important things that are needed in our lives to constantly flow in the gifts of the Spirit. A heart that is pure pure, humility as a lifestyle, and childlike faith. Matthew 5 and 8, put Bible on it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see who? God. Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Some believe that calling out greatness in people's lives promotes pride. But true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I'm going to say that again. Some people believe that calling out greatness in people's lives promotes pride in them, but true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's on the screen. Hear this. The truth of God's grace humbles a man without degrading him and exalts a man without inflating him. Did y'all hear what I just said up in this place today? The truth of God's grace that you didn't deserve, that you didn't earn, that there's no possible way that you could have connected it to your life other than Jesus Christ humbles a man without degrading him and exalts a man without inflating him. We see prophecy taking the stage in the last days. We see prophecy in Acts chapter 2 in the, in the, in the, in the early church and Peter stands up and he's preaching a message and the Bible says this in Acts 2, 14 and 18. If you're ready, shot, I'm ready. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be it known unto you, heed my words. He says, these men and these in the upper room are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 a.m. in the morning, the third hour of the day. But this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. In other words, this is what was prophesied by Joel, verse 17, and it will come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on who flesh? All flesh. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. If you got flesh, God is saying, I'm going to pour something out on your life. Your sons and your daughters will do what? Prophesy. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit and even they shall prophesy. He's making the connection that if you have flesh, I'm calling you to prophesy. Our children are not called to play games for an hour on a Sunday morning and get a treat for being good listeners like they're some kind of a dog. They are called to prophesy in these last days. I am not talking about giving them screen time. I'm not talking about rewarding them with it. All that stuff is good. But there comes a time when the church will begin training up this generation to prophesy. What good is it if we just reward them by doing what we say and we don't show them what God said in these last days? Are you guys uncomfortable? You seem a little 
seem a little quiet today. I'll just preach a little harder and make it more awkward. Somebody shout prophesy. How many believe our children are called to prophesy? If you have grandchildren, they don't even have to be attached to Gulf Coast Church. No, no matter where they are, Sunday morning, we've relegated them to some part of a, a complex and they have to learn the Bible in their own way when they could be teaching us something about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't, have, to, I don't have to teach my kids to have faith. I just have to teach my kids how to walk by faith. That's the difference, right? So my children, Ainsley and Malachi, I'll just speak for them, Ainsley 8, Malachi 6, my children will prophesy all the days of their life. They will declare those things that are not as though they were. And not because I have something to give them that is not from me, no, because I believe that God's word says that when sons and daughters will prophesy, that includes my children in these last days. So include your children, include your grandchildren, include your great-grandchildren inside of this context and say, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren will carry the prophetic mantle on their life. They will prophesy. Pastor, but they are not even in the kingdom. Prophesy them back into the kingdom and watch them prophesy based on what God's done in their life. Pastor, but they're away from God right now. No, they're not. They're working on their testimony on the way back to the kingdom. They're working on their story. They're, 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 they're getting ready to turn their pain into a platform and their misery into a ministry. And God is about to launch them out through the prophetic mandate of God. What do you want me to say, that they're going to stay in their mess? No, their mess is going to turn into a miracle. And God's going to use them to prophesy in these last days. And revival will be birthed through their obedience. I believe that with all of my heart. We just declare that. We declare over all of your sons and daughters. They're going to prophesy. If you're old in here, start dreaming. If you're young, start getting vision. I don't know where you fall. You determine where you fall. I'm just saying if you're old, start dreaming. If you're young, start casting vision. No matter where you fall, God is calling all of us to prophesy. I used to joke. I used to joke coming up um, in Bible college, all of us did actually, where uh, our Bible college, we had people from all over, all over the nations. And we had this one guy who was from Africa. And, um, and we had like a really large storm and tornadoes were going off. And it, it was just, it was one of those situations where it was about to turn dangerous. And all of us knew it. And they made us go to our dorms. And, and this guy from Africa, and he was like, listen, nothing is going to harm me. I'm like, what? No, sir, a tornado is coming. He was like, I have nations in my belly. And I'm like, what? You have nations in your belly. What he was saying was, he said, my mother prophesied over me that I would be a voice to the nations. My grandmother prophesied over her that she would be a voice to the nations. Her great, 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 and he started going back and talking about the lineage. He was saying, There's, there is nations inside of me that I, when I open up my mouth, I can speak healing over nations. And he was actually biblical. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah 1 and 5, before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you and he sanctified you to be a prophet to the nations. God has something inside. Right now, we are prophesying to nations. Africa is watching right now. Indonesia is watching, watching right now. India is watching right now. And every week they watch. We're prophesying to the nations. So whenever you lift up your worship, you are prophesying to the nations of the world. Do you understand this? So if you can prophesy to the nations, prophesy to yourself. I declare that my body is healed. I declare that my mind is restored. I declare that I will walk in the statues of God all the days of my life. I declare that my steps are ordered by God. Whenever your feet hit the floor, you are a world changer and a giant killer, and something is about to change in your future. What else would we say? We are prophets to this nation called to prophesy to this world. Are you with me? Edify, exhort, comfort. Somebody said, Pastor, I just want to come to church on Sunday and then go home. Well, you can do that, 
but I'm just going to encourage you to prophesy on the way, okay? Joel prophesied it. Peter prophesied it. We are living in it. The early church lived in the glory of God, and we're called to live in that glory too. We only typically read, I'm almost done. We only typically read the first part of Romans 3. I'm talking about prophecy. Romans 3, you know, theologians call it the Romans road. This is how you lead someone to salvation, right? When you come up to someone, hey, listen, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, but if you confess with your mouth Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, the wages of sin is death, gift of God is eternal life. So it's this Romans road that you lead people on to accept Christ. But we, we, miss, we miss an assignment on this Romans road typically. Romans 3, 23, 24, let me show you what prophecy really does. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned. Does everyone believe that you were born in sin and shapen in iniquity? That's what your Bible says. In fact, the Bible says that if you say that you have no sin in your life, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. That's what your Bible says, not me. And so you, you, we are all born into sin, shaping in iniquity, so we needed somebody to pull us out of that whose name was Jesus, right? So all have sinned, but we stop there because the Bible says that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified, just if I've never sinned, freely by his grace given to us, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, we turn away from our sin and we walk towards Christ and we walk into the glory of God that through our sin we fell short of. So we typically focus really hard on the all have sin part, but we neglect the coming up short part. Let me help you. Jesus died for two areas in your life. He died for your sin. How many are thankful for that? And he died for your shortcomings as well. He died for the areas of your life where something was assigned to you and you, you're living your life in darkness and you constantly come up short because in order to hit the mark, you have to believe on Jesus Christ. And so he died for your sin and he died for your shortcomings. How do I know this? Because all have sinned, he died for that, and fallen short of the glory of God. He died for coming up short as well. So Jesus died for sin and shortcomings. Are we all on the same page? Remember that Jesus did not just die for our sins, but he offered up his life because we fell short of the glory of God. Prophecy brings people into a revelation of the glory of God that is assigned to their life. This exposure brings conviction in our lives that we are living below the glorious standard that God has set for all of us. So here's the edification. Here's the exhortation. Here's the comfort. There is glory that is assigned to your life. There is, there is a measure of glory that God has assigned to you. And how do you achieve that? You accept Christ, and then you keep following him, and then more glory begins to be unveiled in your life. How do I know this? Because the Bible says we go from what? Glory to glory to glory to glory. So every step that we take in obedience, there's a new measure of glory assigned to my life. You've not ever experienced the amount of glory that's on the other side of your obedience today. There's something assigned to you. There's a presence of God that, 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 that so desires to engulf your life tomorrow if you obey him today. He says there's a glory assigned to you. There's a glory assigned to your calling. And the only way to achieve this is to unlock and through obedience and listening to God all that he has planned for you. So Jesus died for us to have glory right here on the earth. Is that right? Say amen. amen. Is glory only reserved for when we get to heaven? No. He says, our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, what? Come. Thy will be 
done. And so the will of God, part of the will of God for your life is to unveil the glory that he assigned to you before you were even created. Prophecy ties a rope of love around your insecurities and pulls you into the lap of the Father where love and his blood blot out wrongdoings. What is prophecy? Prophecy throws out a word. That, that, that rope of that word ties around your insecurities. It pulls you into the lap of the Father where love and his blood blot out wrongdoings. Prophecy removes condemnation and imputes conviction. What is condemnation? Condemnation is the one thing that we've done that kills us. Conviction protects us from the one thing that can kill us. Are you still with me? How many know that God is always speaking? How many know that God's called you to prophesy? How many know that God's called you to speak in tongues and interpret those tongues? Not as many. That's okay. We'll get you next week. If we can grasp this revelation, I'm almost done. If we can grasp this revelation and we can realize that most of us don't really know how well we see and hear God, we can begin to tune our receivers to his station. For example, in this room right now, there is music playing all around us. If you close your eyes and you listen carefully, you would not hear it. However, by simply turning on a radio, you would perceive what was there the entire time. The reason is that our human bodies were never designed to perceive radio waves. Likewise, God is always speaking to us. The gift of prophecy is the equipment that we need to tap into the spirit realm that exists all around us, even though you cannot hear it with your naked ear. The gift of prophecy is like a radio receiver from heaven. It gives us the ability to hear what God has been speaking the entire time. So there's words out there right now in this atmosphere that God's just waiting on you to tune in to what he's saying so that he can speak to your life. So what is prophecy? It's a supernatural utterance in a known tongue. Tongues is a supernatural utterance in an unknown tongue. Prophesy means to speak for another. So, so prophecy can mean to speak for God or be his spokesperson. Worship team, run up here because these people are getting really nervous. 1 Thessalonians 5, and I'm done. 1 Thessalonians 5, I save the best part for last. Prophecy, declaring, not name it, claim it, grab it, blab it, coming into an agreement with the word of God over my life and prophesying alignment with the glory that's assigned to me. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 24. Now we exhort you, this is Paul talking Warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with everybody. See that no one renders evil for evil, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Verse 16, rejoice always. Somebody say always. Pray without stopping. Verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God of Christ concerning you. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. How do you quench the spirit? He says to do something, you don't do it, spirit is quenched. You also quench the spirit by delayed obedience. So delayed obedience is disobedience. Verse 20. Do not, Paul is writing, despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the peace of God sanctify you completely. Your whole spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved blameless at the coming of Jesus. Here it is, verse 24. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. That verse says, if he called you to it, he's going to get you through it in Jesus' name. The great news, the great news 
about prophecy is you don't have to stay where you are. You can go from beyond where you are now into a new realm of glory that's assigned to your life. Edify, exhort, and comfort. Don't miss this. Prophecy points the reality that we are made in the image of God. Prophecy points the reality that we are made in the image of God. You did not paint yourself. God painted all of us. We are made in the image of God. Not only that, but Jesus is the one who sat in the chair and he modeled for the portrait. We are created in his image and in his likeness. And every time we demean ourselves, we are talking badly about the artist and the model. The truth is that the beauty of creation actually gives glory to the creator. Prophecy reveals the true character of Christ and the plan of God for our lives.